And, and here's our panel. We have uh, Mark Kowalski from ONS in Greenwich, Dave Lutton here in DC, Jerry Williams from Rothman in, in Philadelphia, and Butch Christian, uh, who gave us a great talk. Butch, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Who's joining us remotely from uh, Dallas, Texas. So here are the rules of the panel. If this thing is, so everyone gets surgery. Sorry, Mark. Okay, <laughs> work at the hospital for special surgery. It's not the hospital for special injections or physical <laughs> therapy or any of the sort. All right, not everyone gets a reverse butch. Okay, so despite a t I'm taking moderator privilege here a little bit uh, in terms of changing the topic, so there will be some anatomic cases that we will go through. Um, you only get the images provided. Sorry, Dave. Um, so don't ask for more. It's typical panel rules. Let's keep going here. And you only get two minutes of comment, all right? We've got to keep this thing moving. A lot of cases to get through. So let's keep it moving here. So let's go to the next slide. So this is the first one. We're going to start, start on easy again. Well, can we go back, please? I'm not sure. This, I, this thing is not working for me. I'm sorry. So 68-year-old nurse anesthetist, had a total shoulder replacement 15 years ago complicated by rotator cuff failure, had multiple attempts at rotator cuff repair, several op notes comes in, stack of, have no idea actually what's happened at any of these uh, surgeries, but comes in, with, comes in with this. So we're gonna start out easy, okay? This is the easiest case that we're gonna do. <laughs> Jerry, what are you thinking about that? Can you see the serial number of the uh, implant <laughs> through her skin? <laughs> um. No, but I could probably feel the number of uh, sutures along the lateral aspect of her humerus. Yeah. So you worry about the deltoid a little bit. Clearly, she's got cuff insufficiency. She has humeral deficiency. And if you're lucky, the glenoid is not quite in the right place, and maybe there's still a little bone there you can use. Yeah, there's a big wad of cement there in the glenoid. It's kind of so. low, though, so I, you might be able to get away with something above it. Yeah, okay, something above it, perhaps, yeah. And that, that, I mean, I agree with you. So clearly, I mean, what are your thoughts, David, with a patient like this? Is this a salvageable shoulder? Is there something, or do you tell them? Well, certainly, first thing, I'm not sure if this is on, but certainly the first thing that we think about, you know, an obligatory, you know, comment is making sure this patient isn't infected, right? Mm -hmm. So this patient has had a number of different surgeries. We want to make sure that, you know, all of our lab values, maybe an aspiration, et cetera. I'm going to you know, assume that that's all negative at this point since mm. your initials are on her shoulder and uh, we're proceeding with Oh, surgery. she's getting cut. So <laughs> I think that um, the, the first thing that uh, these are, you went to surgery with these two images. No, we, we have a plan going okay, on perfect. here. So, yeah. so yeah. it's going to say, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you and Sethi, I just, don't know. Just shooting from the hip balls. here. Shooting from the hip. See how it all plans out. So just bottom, just, bottom, just like this panel. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, obviously, you know, we would want, you know, further advanced imaging. You're seeing, you know, that, you know, you've got the chromium's been eroded away. You've got that high riding, very high riding uh, humerus. You've got tremendous humeral bone loss. I'm hoping that you've got a uh, cavitary defect where you could still achieve some uh, rim fit with a reverse and medial fixation, you know, with some, some grafting. But really, again, you need a little bit more information before you yeah. proceed with that. That's fair. Mark, um, David mentioned uh, infection workup. So what, what do, you, do you do an infection workup on all of your revision arthroplasties? I do, and I assume Paul yeah. Sethi did the infection workup before they no, came he, up. No, he gave her the infection. Before he sent it yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, to me. I, yeah, I do, and, uh -huh. and I... He's in Riverside. Yeah. You know, I, I do do an infection workup on everybody. So what, what does that entail? It typically entails serology, the ESR, CRP, a, a white blood cell count. I still do an aspiration, even though I know they're of limited value. Um, and I think in an equivocal case, there's still a role for me with arthroscopic biopsy if the workup's negative but the suspicion is yeah. high. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, she's already had a ton of surgery, and we want to make sure if we're going to operate again, it's going to be our last operation. So. That's fair. So in this case, would you go so far as to take a biopsy of her? Um, in this case, I would not, no. No, okay, so no. you do an aspiration, yeah. blood work, everything's negative. Yeah. Um, Butch, I've heard uh, Jill at least speak before in terms of if you're planning a reverse shoulder replacement, getting bilateral humeral films so that when you can match the uh, humeral length. Is this, um, is this a patient that you think you can you know, restore the humeral length on? You know, this is, uh, this is the big worry in this case. 
right? Because obviously there's proximal humeral bone loss. And one of the things that's important for us is to obtain scale bilateral humeral films. Now that's the only way I personally can evaluate the humerus. Uh, as Jerry said, the glenoid, glenoids of concern, you know, this, uh, and, and the thing is, this is what the bone looks like now. And you got to get your hands on it and get that stem out and then see what the bone looks like. So there's, there's a lot of concern in restoring humeral length here, as well as obtaining proper fixation. With that big hole in the glenoid, once you take that cement out, you're definitely going to have to fill that. Yeah, no doubt. My, you know, my concern is that we talk a lot about humeral length films, though. And uh, I mean, this lady's lived with this humor sticking out of her deltoid, almost tickling her chin or ear for some time. And uh, my concern is just that I, I don't know that you're going to be able to truly restore the length of this humerus. So this is what we're looking at. These are the 3D reconstructions here. Jerry, what are you thinking? So, you know, we have the implant that's proud. We have cement on the humeral side. We have a whole slew of humeral problems. Um, and then the uh, glenoid itself, too, has a huge central cavitary defect here. So the um, first thing I'm thinking is that these are an amazing CAT scans for, with metal in place. I don't know how you get these. I've never seen anything like this. It's spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, so what I would do in this particular case, let's talk about the glenoid first. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you could get uh, s some sort of revision component, VRS or something like that, uh, that could get you a component that would fit in that glenoid and have at least two or three screws that were in good position. I would probably be looking at putting it a little bit higher than normal because like you, I think trying to get the humeral length all the way back out um, is difficult. I have gone to using uh, films on both sides, but to be honest with you, I have never, and I do mean never, been able to get one that is chronically measured at say seven centimeters back to seven centimeters. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fit. I start at seven, then I go down to five, then I go down to four, and eventually get in at four and a half or three. So I wouldn't be looking to go completely back out the length with the humerus. I would have an allograft available, but I would be looking at putting it uh, relatively high, maybe not quite as long as the other humerus. And I think the, the major deforming force that's hard to overcome is the long head of the triceps. Hmm. I think the long head of the triceps in these patients is extremely short, and it's a huge muscle. Um, and what you don't want to do is to rock the glenoid out uh, with too much tension on it. Yeah. David, what, what are your thoughts in this case? So we don't have autograft necessarily, unless you want to go to the LA Crest, which is an option here. So what are your thoughts in terms of metal by way of a custom implant like a VRS versus allograft? Because you're going to have to make up some bone here, obviously, on the glenoid. So probably four years ago, I was doing a lot of bone grafting. And with the technology that we now have, this is where VRS really plays a tremendous role for me, because it's one less thing that I have to worry about failing in the post-operative time period. So for me, this is a custom implant all the way. What, what do you think, Mark? Do you agree, I, disagree? Yeah, I agree. I think it, also in light of just her history of multiple surgeries, I think you, you want to give her the single, simple operation that's going to give her the most longevity and less risk of complications. So for me, it would be a VRS rather than grafting. Yeah. Hey, Butch, um, how concerned are you that this prosthesis has been sticking through her anterior deltoid um, when you're planning on potentially doing a reverse shoulder replacement? You know, it's a big concern, you know, going back one more quick comment on the, on the glenoid itself, you know, I've maimed plenty of iliac crests in my career and I won't do it again because uh, almost 10 years ago I had a patient who I took a big crest on to put into something like this. He walked around the corner six weeks after uh, his implant in clinic and I heard a big pop because he fractured the rest of his iliac wing. Mm. And uh, he was in a nursing home for about three months after that. So that was the last iliac crest I did. But yes, the deltoid is a concern. However, you know, this has evolved over time. And, you know, she, these kinds of patients tend to learn how to not remodel, but work their deltoid around this. We always get an EMG preoperatively. And if the axial nerve is functioning, you know, we know that the reverse can be driven by even just the medial and the posterior deltoid as the axial nerve comes around. So I'm not as worried about the anterior deltoid as long as she has uh, enough skin there. Great, thank you. So, so this is our plan. It's actually sort of funny because I feel like when you look at this case um, on the surface, you're concerned about the glenoid, but I do think that the VRS is actually, or some form of custom uh, in implant on the glenoid side, has actually made that part of the surgery relatively easy. Mm -hmm. And the hard part of this is soft tissue balancing and, and the humeral side. So this is what we plan for. This is actually pre-VRS. Um, so this was just a compassionate use custom implant uh, that we had used, and we put this in. 
Um, on the humoral side, I mean, she had this huge cement mantle here, and we ended up shortening her, her humerus considerably, and that's what it took to be able to do the soft tissue balancing. Um, and then we just did a cement in cement here, um, which is, I think, a pretty easy technical bailout. But Mark, critique it. What do you think about the cement on cement on the humerus side? Did I um, bail out and give her too little here, or should I put a bigger cement uh, or a bigger humeral stem in? Um, I, you know, it looks like you could have gone bigger. I, I think it's always a challenge, and you're sort of weighing risks. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's fine. My, my only thought is just the concept of deltoid wrap, and if, if you thought about APC or yeah. some of the implants that have some, a metaphyseal replacement component to it. That, that's a great point. You know, she was extraordinarily even tight getting her down in this position, even taking off probably a third of her proximal humerus. They always are. Yeah, right. So, um, Jerry, Jerry, what do you think? Would you have spent um, hours trying to get that huge cement mantle out? Or Those you of you who know me know the answer to that is <laughs> hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, what do you what, So, Larry, talk to us about how you decided the amount of lateralization you're doing through the base plate. So with the VRS, that's what I've struggled with is yeah. figuring out where I want to put the base plate and can I build up for the glenosphere or humerus because it's a struggle sometimes when it's too lateral and you can't, as Jerry was saying, reduce the shoulder. So, so such a great point. My I actually, own thing I, is that's gestalt. But yeah, I but I think it's more about inferiorization, not lateralization. I really and truly believe that this is the long head of the triceps. Hmm. And if, I mean, if you don't want to be too lateral. But I think that lateralization is better tolerated than inferiorization. And I think if you had to choose between putting it a little higher with a little more offset laterally as opposed to down low and less offset, you're way better off a little higher with lateralization. Yeah. So are you releasing the triceps this area? You can't. <laughs> I, I, I challenge you to, reach the, to release the entire infraspinatus mm -hmm. or the entire Longhead. long head of the triceps from, from a delta pectoral approach. It is impossible. If you, look at the, if you look at the origin site of the long head of the triceps in a cadaver, it's about three inches long and about two inches wide. It's huge. It takes the entire inferior portion of the glenoid. You cannot release it. Yeah. I, I, I think to your point, I, so the two things I've learned from doing these custom glenoids is number one, when you send it to the engineers and they send it back, they always try to completely recreate the joint line and I think they kick it out too lateral. Okay, so I've always asked them to medialize it a bit because these are tremendously contracted soft tissue cases yeah, and, sure. and I have got myself in trouble by trying to be too heroic by trying to recreate too much metal in there. The second thing is if you notice that we didn't go all the way posterior. Here as we go around the back, you see how there's still some bone posterior? You need to put a retractor posteriorly, okay, in order to see. And if your plan is to have metal fill the entire posterior vault of the glenoid, then you have no retractor to move the humeral head out of the way. And I found that it's very challenging. So the two things I'll do routinely is I ask the engineers to uh, take away some metal, medial, medialize it a bit, and the other thing is take away some metal posteriorly so I have a rim and glenoid. Any other tips or pearls you guys have had with these customs? Yeah, I've had, I've had the exact same experience with ha actually having to ask them to medialize it mm -hmm. a little bit more than their original plan. Mm -hmm. uh, that's number one. And number two, kind of understanding the pathology that's led to this severe bone loss. So if we go back to kind of the old school, you know, wet versus dry arthritis, if we think about someone who has um, rheumatoid arthritis, it's going to be a lot more supple shoulder and it's going to be a lot easier to get your releases and your soft tissue balance as opposed to something like this where it's going to be much more challenging. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Butch, Butch, any words of um, wisdom using these custom glenoids? Yeah, the last point is really, Jerry made such a sophisticated point that these people can tolerate more lateralization, and if you really inferiorize or distalize them, that's when you get into brachial plexus problems. Yeah. And that's the one thing we didn't really talk about, the, the shortening that happens in and around the plexus, not with the nerves, just the scar tissue underneath the conjoint tendon. So be really careful with distalizing, and I totally agree with all the points that sometimes uh, you know, it's better to be a little bit more medialized, but not too distalized. So, Larry, one more point. Go back to the last slide. Real quick point. When you, when, if you're ever going to get involved in doing VRS or any other custom-type situations, you really have to remember that the engineers that are involved in helping you come up with this idea are engineers. Mm -hmm. They've never held a scalpel in their hand before. You need to help them understand what you need them to do. You can't let them tell you. you need, it needs to be a 
back and forth. They usually have figured out how long the minimum length of the screws in bone has to be for them to feel comfortable to let you put that in. Mm -hmm. It's usually around 25, 28 millimeters. Sometimes you have to either angle the screw or the metal a little bit more anniverted so you get through the thicker portion of the uh, scapula to get a long enough screw to use one of these. Larry, did you use EMG monitoring? We did not. No, is that something you routinely do? Not routinely, but yeah. something like this I certainly would think would you, about. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, yeah. So Comment. these are all great, yeah, great points on the glenoid. I just did a case similar to this, and I'm very concerned about the humeral side as well. What are the panel's feelings on uh, bony replacement with allograft versus using metal for humeral bone loss? Mark, what do you think about that? Allograph, APC, or are we doing uh, tumor prostheses? Yeah, I mean, I asked you about it. I yeah. think in this case, though, I agree with you. She's, she's been so sort of proximally retracted for so long, and you know it's going to be a tight case, so mm -hmm. I, I also probably wouldn't have used it in this case. Mm -hmm. I think when length is more or less restored and there is a deltoid wrap issue and loss of proximal bone, then I'll consider it. Consider which consider, uh, APC. APC. So APC is your go-to mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, megaprosthesis yeah. or so. David, how about you? Metal I'm, or I'm, I'm dead using bone. metal all the way. Are you? Yes. Jerry, well, metal or dead bone? I'm schizophrenic. I do metal on the glenoid side and the APC on the humeral side. Hmm. All so right. I, I can't. I can't really. So that's schizophrenic. <laughs> Got that's it. Schizophrenic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, Butch. How about you on the humeral side? APC yeah. versus uh, megaprosthesis. Yeah, metal. We've uh, really had not a great success rate with APCs because of infection, so we use metal. Got it. Yeah. So I mean, this she's actually five years out. Surprisingly, everything's still in. I mean, th I think this is the longest she's gone after a surgery and not had a complication. So knock on wood, we'll see. And I mean, I think this is a, I would say, reasonable result. This is That's what we're going to expect. Outcome, yeah, right. we're going to say she can get her hand to her head, she can get her hand to her mouth. And, you know what, uh, Delary? This is what I tell you know, all the residents and fellows who have heard this from me. Forgive me, but. The best way to get a satisfied patient is to make a difference between where they started and where they wound up dramatic. Mm -hmm. And even though this result in your hands is probably not one that you're just really proud of because it's not quite as good as you'd like it to be, from her perspective, it's a home run, grand, yeah. grand she slam, absolutely loves center it. field. She loves it. Right. Yeah. No, she's thrilled and delighted. So, all right. So let's go here. So, so that was our easy case. Okay. <laughs> now I'm kidding. So 82-year-old, this is a guy, uh, shoulder OA really limited motion, doesn't even get up to 90 degrees, 80 degrees, zero degrees of external rotation, back pocket, but he has good rotator cuff strength, okay? So here, here is the uh, x-rays and CT scan. Mark, what, what are your thoughts? So it's an 80-something-year-old guy, really poor motion. First of all, are we doing an anatomic versus a reverse? Let's assume his rotator cuff is fine. Sure. I, I, you know, Jay Keener will tell you that even though the rotator cuff might be fine, there's right. a certain amount of rotator cuff dysfunction. Mm -hmm not just based on his age, but the profound limitation in motion that he's had for a while. Mm -hmm. So I'd actually consider this sort of a rotator cuff deficient patient, and then combined with the, with the retroversion that you see there on the glenoid side, I'd be thinking about a reverse. In him. Anybody disagree? Would anybody, Butch, David, Jerry, anybody doing an uh, anatomic? No, okay. No. All right, so uh, this amount of bone loss, or uh, erosion, let's say bony deformity, okay, is this concerning or are we just doing our standard run-of-the-mill reverse shoulder replacement? Jerry, what do you think? I would do a reverse with an augmented base plate. What augmented, where would you put the augment? Posterior superior. Posterior superior. And what kind of augment do you use? This would be a full wedge. Full. Um, so, uh, you know, again, this again, non-FDA approved, so I might give my uh, disclosure. I don't like onlay humeruses, so I would do a, um, I would use the right medical or strike, striker uh, full wedge augmented base plate with the wedge posterior superiorly, and I would use a DJO inlay humerus in the, the size that overlaps as a 36. So you're mixing and matching here. I am. Okay, all right, so you get Taylor made. I will just say for um, any of the trainees in the audience here, the first thing on that AP x-ray that gives you an inclination that you're dealing with some glenoid bone loss here is how medial the uh, greater tuberosity is in conjunction with the lateral edge of the acromion, okay? So when you look at that AP x-ray, you see that things are medial there. Um, you know that you're already dealing with the problem even before you, even before you get the, uh, the CAT scan. David, what, what do you think? Is that a bone that you're worried about or is that just throw a standard reverse in? Or are you gonna do something special? I, I'd use a metal wedge as well. I mean, mm -hmm. typically in this, what I'll do is I'll uh, preoperatively template this on at least one system, if not two, to see what mm -hmm. fits the best. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with Dr. Williams that essentially that's just where you're gonna go, posterior superior wedge and see what fits. This is one that 
I would not worry about bringing back to neutral. I'd probably leave the patient at you know, you know, nine, ten degrees of retroversion and kind of play it where it goes. Yeah, um, Butch Jerry mentioned that he likes an he doesn't not like an onlay uh, humerus. He likes an inlay humerus. What are your thoughts on inlay versus onlay humeruses? Humeri. Yeah, I, I totally I totally agree with Jerry. We had uh, we started using an onlay humerus almost a decade ago and uh, started seeing problems that I've never seen before: brachioplexopathies, mm -hmm. problems in the acromion, the scapulae, and I went back to an inlay humerus. But I I will. In this case, the predominant plane of deformity is uh, medialization and also secondarily retroversion. So for us, I would use uh, his own bone if I can. Mm -hmm. You know, the augment that Jerry was talking about is eight millimeters in thickness on one side and four millimeters on the other side. So if I can't get enough bone to reconstruct this from his humeral head, then I'll use an augmented glenoid and an inlay humerus. So if you look at that coronal CT scan on the uh, lower right here, it's really highlighting, I think, a problem that Pascal Boileau has talked about the RSA angle, if you will. Mm -hmm. So there's some, um, if you look, the inclination is really not bad. In fact, actually, when we use our 3D planning, which I'm about to show you in the next slide, it only says a two degree inclination. But the problem is that you want to put your glenosphere inferior, right? Because you want some clearance inferiorly to prevent scapular notching. And if you see that, I mean, there's quite a bit of protrusio there, and you're going to have to make up that uh, bone loss in order to place the implant inferiorly and still have it at either neutral or inferior tilt, which is what we're, uh, we're planning for. So, so this is the, the planning software that I use. They're actually saying 40 degrees of retroversion. On, you can play around with that quite a bit. I think there's a bit of an osteophyte super, uh, mm -hmm. anteriorly that's doing it. That's, uh, affecting the uh, measurements a bit, but still, uh, this patient has posterior and superior um, bone wear. So here I'm using a posterior superior augment, just as Jerry mentioned. Jerry, how much retroversion will you accept in a reverse shoulder replacement? Mm, 10, maybe 15. 10, 15. If it's really bad bone loss and I'm trying to go for the alternate center line that Mark Frankel talks about a lot, maybe 15 or 20, but that's rare. What do you think, Mark? What, how much, what, what are your goals for implantation sure. of reverse shoulder replacement in terms of retroversion? Sure. You know, I shoot for 10, but there's plenty of people that accept the retroversion that they have as long mm -hmm. as they get adequate fixation. So mm -hmm. I certainly shoot for 10, but you're, you're trying to correct two planes of deformity here, mm -hmm. and you have a wedge of a certain dimension. So yeah. um, I, I'd shoot for 10, get as much as I can, honestly, and, and also focus as much on inclination. Yeah. I, so I feel exactly the same way. So I was going for 10, but in this case, I felt like, you know, bumping it up to 14, put that post right down the center of the vault, and that gave me a little bit better you know, deal. It's and fun. that avoided having to use a yeah. bone graft in this case. So using the augment that we had available to us. So yeah, fi <laughs> fixation's more important than, you know, our retroversion there. Yeah. And that's perfect. Yep. So, yeah, so I, I found these, um, you know, off the shelf uh, augments. I think most companies offer these um, now. Uh, and it's been really uh, a nice way to be able to restore the joint line without having to sacrifice bone. Anna, what are your uh, thoughts? So for you and the panel and Butch, how do you decide how much distalization you're going to do to do this placing of the base plate in fear that you speak of so highly versus going just lateralized to prevent notching and maybe get some better rotation? So I think that's a really key nuance point, okay? So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, which is that obviously we don't want the inferior cup hitting the inferior bony glenoid, right? And there's two ways to do that. The historic way to talk about doing that is by putting the glenosphere inferior so you have clearance so you prevent the notching, okay? But if you're using a lateralized glenosphere, as in the DJO system is one, then you have the clearance through the lateralization. So I still will use a medialized, for the most part, uh, uh, glenoid. So I'm still trying to get this thing inferior. But Butch, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think in terms of lateralization versus inferiorization to be able to prevent inferior bony notching? So not blowing smoke, Larry, but that x-ray looks great. And you know, the, if you look at the uh, lateral border of the scapula and follow it around over to the edge of the glenosphere, there's no overhang of the glenosphere, and you can almost draw a perfect arch to the medial aspect of the humeral shaft. And that's a line, we're, we're starting to call this the Mediterranean arch, and we've started to find that if the sphere is not below that line, if it actually forms that beautiful arch, then patients are able to internally rotate back behind, uh, higher than the L2 level to T12 and even higher. 
So I try to put the sphere as close to that edge as possible, not overhang it immediately. I don't use an inferior overhang sphere. And I try to restore, as Mark Frankel has talked about, the pivot point, which is as close to the center of rotation where the humeral shaft should be. Yeah. Mark, anything to add? No, I agree. I mean, I, I absolutely emphasize less placing that glenosphere too into The glenospheres we're using now are different than the ones we used initially. Yeah. And we used to emphasize putting it as low as possible. And it's, it's virtually impossible to avoid over lengthening if you do that. So yeah. I, I really try to avoid placing the glenosphere too low. I agree with you. I think that's a fine. And I've, yeah, all my first x rays would show huge overhang inferiorly, mm -hmm. right? And all my new x rays, hopefully, if I did what I was planning on, more, more look like this. So otherwise, you're really linking out. That, that's a great point. That you yeah. have to emphasize that, that this is an anatomic glenoid now, essentially. Mm -hmm. you know, you're not getting that huge overhang mm -hmm. crystallizing right. the arm, which gives a pain, flexopathy, stress fracture, whatever. Yeah, no doubt. All right, so here we have an 80 year old, okay, um, bilateral shoulder pain, rheumatoid arthritis comes in with this, cuff tear arthropathy, superior acetabularization of the, the acromion as well here. So we have this large, it's basically the same case. Would anybody do anything differently with this? We are, we are more medial here. There's not quite as much glenoid bulk to work with. Are we still using some form of off-the-shelf implant here, or would anybody consider putting bone in here? Mark, what do you think? Um, I, you know, like Butch, I, I do use the patient's own bone you know, when I can, especially when they're younger. I think rheumatoid patients are different, though. In, uh, in this case, I would avoid using her own bone. Yeah. David, what do you think? Yeah, I worry about, I mean, I, I worry about doing a lot of bone grafting anyway, but certainly with the rheumatoid, you're, you're taking an autographed head and putting it right there. And even though it'll look good now, I worry two years from now what it's going to look like. But I think that a lot of times these patients are also pretty small, so I would... Uh, make sure that your implants actually fit in that vault, and if they don't actually fit, then you think about something else. Mm -hmm. what, are you doing bio-RSAs at all, Jerry? Um, not much anymore. I did for a while, and I didn't do them for people that didn't have bone deformity, as I know Pascal has done on occasion. I did it for people with bone deformity, but um, I think you guys have probably read the article that we put out of our place. We didn't do too well with bone grafts, mm -hmm. so I basically stopped doing them for the most part. Yeah. I think for me in this case, it was really just how much vault we had for fixation. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of our pre-op planning, the software can help you. Well, I realize right. I'm in the mi minority, um, but the bottom line is my, ex my own personal experience with my own bone grass was not great. Not great, yeah. Brad, go ahead. Larry, talk to me about why you chose to use this implant for this case with a bone grass. So, you know, I've had the experience where I've used a screwing base plate mm -hmm. with a full backside bone grass. Interposed between the native and the base plate, I've had a failure. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I used it in post with some sort of ingrowth fixation, that's been more likely to have the graft incorporated. So you use the DGO, which is screw and base plate, mm -hmm. it's going to give you compression. Right. But, but it's not maybe going to give you growth, you know, ingrowth. So talk to me about that. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great point. I, I think you're right. So uh, when uh, Tom Norris st started talking about taking the iliac crest, um, and, and the folks in France talking about doing bio RSAs, they had to use the long post, right, to get into the native bone. And that's how they had uh, ingrowth. I think the screw gives you compression, and as long as you get incorporation of the graft into your uh, native glenoid, um, you're kind of okay. But it, it's a good point. So the reason for this case was just basically to use a screw to be able to get compression as opposed to depending on just the, the, uh, the post. But I think that's a very, very good point. Let's go here. All right, so this actually, this is, let's change things a little bit here. 34 year old, so very young, Navy recruiter, extraordinarily active, three prior label repairs, limited range of motion here. Just a standard, standard osteoarthritis, but he's posteriorly um, subluxed. B2 glenoid, I think, would anybody disagree with the B2 glenoid here? Hey, Butch, what are your thoughts? So this guy's going to get a total shoulder replacement or some sort of shoulder arthroplasty. Um, he's young. He's extraordinarily active. Talk to me through hemiarthroplasty versus total shoulder replacement. And total, if you're doing a total shoulder replacement, what are you doing on the glenoid? So I'll tell you, you know, 10 years ago, this would have been just an anatomic total shoulder, and I would ream the high side. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe eight years ago, we started experimenting with augmented glenoids and had the same failure modes, same things we would see. 
So in this case, it's really for me one of two things. Either I'm going to do a hemiarthroplasty, accept where he is, perhaps ream it and shape it a little bit. I have very little experience with the inlay glenoids, uh, kind of, you know, Tony Miniacci has talked about, you know, playing it where it lies. But really to correct the retroversion and bring his joint back out, for me, I'm actually going to do this with a reverse implant. And, uh, you know, one of the talks, that, one of the parts of the talk that I gave was we really found that our complication rate with reverse total shoulders in patients under the age of 50, our own series was less than anatomic totals beyond a five-year point. And I would correct this with bone. I think this is actually a B3 glenoid. I'm looking at CT scan. I don't know if that's what you guys have up. But uh, there's not just retroversion. There's, there's medialization, and it's an eroded angle as well. So for me, I will correct this with bone and then use a reverse implant. Hmm. What do you think, David? Ah, uh, this is one I of the. I did say that not everybody's going to reverse in this panel, though. Yeah. But, so, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so not that it's right or wrong. Reverse. Everybody gets a reverse in COVID in Dallas. Okay. <laughs> what do you think, David? Sorry. Uh, so, so this is a person, and this is probably my own bias. I've had some success with this actually, and, and we'll get to the surgical management in a minute. But I have done visco supplementation in some of these patients to kind of push them off. You know, down the road, yeah, we'll get kind surgery. of, you know, all right, so we're, we're, yeah. we're down on surgery. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, this is one of the few times I might think about a hemiarthroplasty. Otherwise, I'm, for me, I'm doing an anatomic with, a, uh, augmented, um, with an augmented. Yeah, yeah. with an augmented. Yeah, Mark, Mark, what do you think about hemiarthroplasty I, versus for me, totals? Yeah, hemi's out for me just based on his glenoid and, and, and mm. subluxation. Yeah. So it's between reverse and total. And we're going to talk later about a 50-year-old with OA and considering mm. reverse. But to me, the, you know, mid-30s is just too young. Uh, so I'm going to do an, an, a half-wedge augmented total mm. with a 35-degree augment with the, with the implant mm -hmm. that I use. So this is Jerry's case. He did a total shoulder with an inlay glenoid. Jerry, talk to us about the inlay glenoid. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, there's good time zero data to show that the loading characteristics are better with an inlay glenoid, so at least there's a chance that they'll last longer, uh, which is my thinking. Uh, the second thing that I always do in these younger patients is try to figure out what the next operation and maybe even the operation after that's going to look like. So I've gone to putting the inlay glenoid superior on the glenoid with, for two reasons. Number one, J.P. Warner's told us that's where it will live. And number two, it leaves the inferior aspect of the glenoid relatively pristine for doing something different in 10 or 15 years. Um, that, that's such a great point. And actually, I just learned something right now. I haven't heard you said that because I do think that the handful of times I've used an inlay glenoid, I, I'm, I, it gives me, it cr I, make, I cringe a little bit with how much bone I'm removing to yeah. be able to get the cement in. And then I worry about having to revise that potentially to reverse with a entire vault filled with cement. I but put a you... relatively small one in high up. You'll notice that I didn't completely correct the retroversion. I agree with Rick Matson uh, that the important point is to get the humeral head centered on the surface of the glenoid rather than changing the retroversion. So um, anyway, that, those are my thoughts. Yeah. Brad. Yeah, just along the lines of what you just said, Larry, has anybody on the panel revised an inlay to do a reverse later on, and just talk to us about your what you saw, and you know, almost a non-event. It's it. almost a non-event. You basically take out the inlay, put cancellous bone in the hole that's left, and then ignore it and yeah. do a normal reverse. I, I have, but it, it, I mean, you're drilling through cement. Is is my experience with doing it? So. I, well, my approach to the cement, I used to try to get all of it out. Yeah. I don't do that anymore. I basically yeah. take out the implant. I assume that when I ream, whatever's loose is gonna come out and whatever's stable is gonna stay there. So I don't try to get any cement out beyond what I ream. So this is, we have literally one minute, 40 seconds to cover this difficult case. This is a 50-something year old guy. That's his uh, CT scan here. Very extraordinarily active. Um, wants to remain active. He has a hemiarthroplasty on the other side for imaging that looks just like this because they felt like they couldn't get a glenoid in. He actually hates his hemiarthroplasty on their side. He has good range of motion, but he still has pain. So, Dave, can, what do you think? Can I see his AP again? Oh. Okay. What do you think, Dave? Well, I don't think that you're going to be able to put an anatomic in that, so that's going to get a reverse for me, probably a wedge. Yeah. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, this is the 50-year-old who would get a reverse, and, and we know that they can be active on the reverse, so that's mm -hmm. not necessarily a contraindication. Jerry, what do you think? I'd be leaning towards a reverse, but I'd like to see the cuts higher up to see if I could put a glenoid at the top. I think I could. Mm -hmm. I think there would be enough glenoid there near the base of the coracoid that you could put in an um, inlay glenoid and do an anatomic, and I would at least play with that idea. 
So we planned this case, got a, a guide for it. This is a case that I feel that having some sort of interoperative uh, uh, guidance helps. Uh, planned it to ream down the anterior 50% of the, of the glenoid and then uh, back up the posterior 50% with uh, autograph from the humeral head and then use this metal um, backed implant here with uh, vitamin E polyethylene liner. He's actually now, I just saw this guy back. So you can actually see the bone graft. That's an immediate post-op yeah. x-ray. There you see the bone graft uh, posteriorly there at the bottom right there. This is him at four years. I just saw this guy back pretty recently. You can make some uh, comments on the humeral head if you want. But, and he's a little anterior on that axillary. But the reality of the situation is that, I mean, this guy at four years at least is loving it. It's his right shoulder. Left one's a hemi, so his range of motion on the hemi is actually pretty good as well. I think it's a, I think it's a great. I've done this before too, Larry. Yeah. The one point that I would make, I'd be wondering how you feel about it. That central boss, there's mm -hmm. a couple of companies that have uh, implants like this. I think this is a Zimmer Biomet one. Yep. Arthrex has one. Um, I think it's very important that that central boss piece gets into native bone because if that's all in bone graft um, and the graft's that big, graft's not going to grow into that central boss and I worry about, I've actually had screws from two different companies fail uh, under those circumstances. That goes back to exactly what Brad had mentioned earlier. I think that's a great point. Brad, so go ahead. Quick question just about placement of this metal back glenoid with the thought of revision to reverse the airline. Yeah. So you put that low on the glenoid so that when you put your glenosphere in eventually, it's going right. to have the right position. But you're maybe not in the position you want to be centered in the glenoid for his anatomic. So how do you balance the two? Yeah, yeah. Well, what you can see, Brad, if you look at that upper film, you can see that that plastic is thick enough that it is holding the humerus away from the glenoid. As it gets smaller, that might be more of an issue, but, um, but you know. Well, these are patients, I really do tell them this when I see a patient like this. I tell them, I'm going to talk with you about three or four options. They all suck. Yeah, with a that's capital right. S. Yeah. That's right. Your job, when we're done talking, is to figure out the one that sucks the least for you. <laughs> that's what I tell them. It's exactly what I tell them. That's great. It's just the way it is. That's great. The one thing that I would say about this type of component is this is sort of perfect in, in this scenario, but if anyone has used a metal back glenoid for an anatomic shoulder replacement, <laughs> you got to be careful about lateralizing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that is a great so, point. Because, the, yeah. because they're that's much good. thicker yeah. than an, a standard uh, Dude, anatomic right. poly. That's that, good. That's right. Mark, any parting words? I mean, we, we, somebody just asked about what it's like to revise an inlay. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, when you're deciding whether you're going to do a total reverse on this patient, and, and Jerry talked about thinking about the next operation, we have data to show that conversion of total to reverse doesn't do as well as mm -hmm. the initial reverse. And mm -hmm. I'd argue that the, the, this revision would be a harder revision than the eventual revision of a reverse if that was your primary operation. Yeah, that's fair. Butch, any experience with a metal-backed anatomic glenoid? Give us the final words, and then we're two minutes over, and we're going to wrap it up then. Final word is when we did this, they all failed. Uh, but I love what you did, and I'd like to see it again in a few years. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, nothing spoils yeah. this like a uh, longer-term outcome. Uh, no follow. I agree. For this well, thank you very much, guys. That was a great discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.